All right, g'day guys. Welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel. Today, we are going to be taking a look at the trade period that happens at the end of the year. I know I'm going early, but starting to get that time of the year where people are sort of speculating on who signed, who hasn't, what trades or free agency moves might happen. Today, I'm going to nominate some of the, you know, some of the biggest stories around who might move to which club, whether they're going to stay with their current club, and sort of give you my thoughts on what might happen in the future and sort of predict what will happen with each individual deal. Obviously, being mid-June there is so much water to go under the bridge and it's almost going to be impossible to realistically predict exactly what's going to happen but I thought it'd be a fun exercise to sort of look at what moves could happen at the end of the year and sort of estimate how likely they are. As we know you know free agency and trade periods have sort of really exploded over the last few years. The, the player movement compared to what it was five to ten years ago it's absolutely monstrous so we know that there's probably going to be a big trade period at the end of this year as well so this probably won't even scratch the surface of some of the deals that are actually going to happen at the end of the year. Before we get into the video, guys, do check out the sponsors of today's video, NordVPN. If you want a good quality and reasonably priced VPN service, go to nordvpn.com. It's the fastest VPN service out there. You can use it to, you know, play video games that are geo-blocked in your country, or, you know, you can access different versions of Netflix, or if you're outside Australia, you can access KO Sports. It also helps encrypt all your traffic so you can browse in a more secure fashion. If you go through True Footy, you can get 70% off their awesome service. So head to nordvpn.com forward slash True Footy and use the discount code True Footy. Or simply go to the link in the description of this video and follow the prompts. Thanks guys, now let's talk about some trades. All right, I'm going to rattle through some names in no particular order here, but I'm going to start off with Richmond's Shire Bolton, who's... I want to say having a breakout year, but we've sort of seen this coming for a couple of years. But I think to say that he's at the best level he's ever performed at is definitely not a stretch. He's averaging 22 disposals a game, a goal and a half a game as well. And stats don't really reflect his impact. He's such a damaging player and can really create opportunities out of nothing in a forward line. The story behind this is he's still out of contract and a WA boy. And there's always been a little bit of talk that Bolton might consider coming home. And the fact that he's unsigned kind of also, you know, leaves that door open. I'd imagine both clubs uh, in Perth are going to be seriously all over this guy. I've heard through the grapevine that the Eagles have made some sort of significant offer, but I don't see how they could realistically get a deal done considering they can't trade their first round of this year. So it's more likely to be Fremantle of the two, particularly if Adam Chera does leave Fremantle, they're going to want to get something back in return. So personally, I think as long as he's unsigned, then clubs are going to come chasing hard. But I think he'd be crazy to leave Richmond. From all reports, he does enjoy the club. He's obviously going to get plenty of opportunity. And I imagine he's going to get a pretty good pay packet as well, unless Fremantle somehow trump it massively. My prediction is that Shy Bolton will stay at Richmond next year. The next player we'll talk about is St. Kilda's Seb Ross, a player that used to be really, really important to them, but has kind of dropped off in the last couple of years. He's still a pretty good player, but I think St. Kilda's reliance on him, it's probably diminished in the last couple of years, especially with guys like Jack Steele and, you know, Brad Crouch entering the club. And they also got youth like Jack Bytel as well. What I'm getting at is he's still a pretty good player, but I don't know if St. Kilda really need him. And if you believe the reports last year, he toured Essendon's facilities. He's got a link to them having, you know, I think his first cousins with Joe Watson. He's an unrestricted free agent, which means a trade doesn't have to take place and he can pretty much walk to any club of his choice. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I think of the ones I'm going to be talking about today, this one seems like it could make sense. I don't think St. Kilda particularly need him. They don't need to fight hard to keep him. I think they've got a good young mix of midfielders in that team. I guess whether Essendon's still interested kind of depends on how they go with some of their other targets, like, you know, your Josh Dunkley's, which I don't think they will end up securing. But on the other hand, with Darcy Parrish becoming the player he is at the moment, their needs may have changed. So I'm going to say... I'm going to err on the side of Seb Ross leaving St. Kilda at the end of the year. Next up, we've got Matt Crouch from the Adelaide Crows, whose brother obviously left the club last year to join St. Kilda. You know, Matty Crouch, he's a pretty good player, pretty good inside mid, accumulates the footy like few others in the competition, but hasn't really got it on the park of late. I think he's battling a groin injury. Haven't really seen him this year. As such, it's his restricted free agency year and his value wouldn't be very high at the moment. I honestly don't know, given, you know, groin injuries are a little bit iffy, if he'd get an offer to warrant a first round draft pick compensation, which means that from Adelaide's perspective, they'd want to force a trade. I could be wrong on that. Clubs may show the faith, but I don't know if there will be the same interest in him to really force a move this particular year. From his perspective, you know, Adelaide's got a good young culture there and a good young list. And, you know, compared to where it was a few years ago, I can see the attraction of staying at Adelaide as well. This one's probably more close to a 50-50, but I'm going to 
we're on the side of Matt Crouch staying at the club on the basis that the interest might not there to really uproot. Next player we'll talk about is Hawthorne's Tom Mitchell. And this is an interesting one. Not many people really would have considered Tom Mitchell a realistic trade target for other clubs. Pretty much at any point through his stay at Hawthorne, obviously he was famously traded from Sydney a few years ago. He's won a Brownlow, broke his leg, and he's, he's in a, some okay form at the moment. But Richmond are apparently in the market for a top-up midfielder in their mid to late 20s, and Tom Mitchell fills that bill. I'd imagine that this is a replacement for Trent Cotchin. And as far as from Tom Mitchell's perspective, Richmond's a pretty attractive place to go, particularly if you're wanting success. From the Hawks' perspective, obviously entering a rebuild at the moment, is their midfield a little bit same-ish with guys like Warple, O'Meara, you know, Finn McGuinness they've drafted as well, and then, you know, this, this Newcomb kid that they've added. I know he's only played one game, but they may look at their mix and think maybe Tom Mitchell at his age 28 isn't really someone we need to keep on the books. I could be wrong on that. I might have that completely wrong because he is a Brownlow medalist, but I'm just trying to make a case for why that move might take place. Again, this is just guesswork. I could definitely see this happening. I'm not going to rule it out, but it would be a very big story if he left. The next player we'll talk about is a lesser profile player, but nonetheless a high draft pick himself. Dylan Stevens was pick five in the 2019 draft of the Sydney Swans. He's a South Australian boy and he's out of contract and this is likely to see him get a bit of interest particularly from, I think the Adelaide Crows have been reported to be into him. He's had a slow start to his career. Sydney have a lot of young talent. He hasn't really had a consistent run at it playing just 12 games across a year and a half. I was a big fan of Stevens and his skill set in his draft year. And I, I know this isn't the best method of, you know, doing your research, but just sort of reading, you know, fan forums and stuff. The opinion from Swans fans on Stevens is that he isn't super valuable. And on that basis, I think there's a chance he's gettable. Now, that doesn't mean the Sydney Footy Club are going to feel the same and they're likely to put up a bit of a fight. But from Adelaide's perspective, they want to obviously jump up the ladder quickly. They want to like short circuit this rebuild. They did it with Jackson Haightley last year in the PSD. I don't think it'll be a PSD. PSD situation here, but I think that will go hard at Stevens and I'm going to predict on the balance of probabilities, he's out of contract. I reckon he is a good chance he makes it to the Adelaide Crows this year. We'll talk about another former top five pick. This time it's Adam Chera from the Fremantle Dockers. Back in 2016, he was drafted with Andrew Brayshaw. And these guys were sort of looking like the sort of midfield saviors in a rebuild for Fremantle. I'm a big fan of him. I think he's got a lot of potential. He hasn't quite shot up as quickly as uh, an Andrew Brayshaw or even, <laughs> quite frankly, a Caleb Sorong's looking very good at that midfield as well. Nonetheless, he's a super important part of Fremantle's rebuild. I think it would be devastating for them if he left, but he has been linked home, in particular to the Richmond Footy Club. Being a younger player, he's not a free agent, so a trade would need to be facilitated. I think he's probably a couple of years away from being a restricted free agent, if I'm not mistaken. You get mixed reports in the media about him committing. I honestly don't know where his head's at. I'm inclined to think he probably hasn't even made that decision himself, and that therefore makes it very hard for people like me to predict. I'm going to guess that his motivation may be success, and whether or not Fremantle can offer that to him, because I believe he's well paid at Fremantle, and it's just about selling a future to him that he can believe he can be a top player at a top club. My guess here, my conservative guess, is Adam Chera signs a two-year extension, but beyond that, I think there's a chance he does end up in Victoria. Now we'll talk about Richmond's Callum Coleman-Jones, the young key forward sort of ruckman that we've seen uh, really take his opportunity at Richmond in the absence of guys like Tom Lynch. He kicked a bag of four against the Adelaide Crows and while he's raw, hasn't necessarily achieved that much. Obviously, there's a bit of a premium on good quality key position forwards, particularly this year. From the Richmond side, the question mark is, can they play Rewalt, Lynch and Callum Coleman-Jones in this forward line? They're three pretty tall blokes and it doesn't sound like Rewalt Walt's going to be retiring anytime soon. I believe he's been offered a contract or signed. I'm not sure, but we can assume he's going to play on. And Richmond have said they want to try all three. For me, looking at where Richmond's at, I think it would be silly for Coleman Jones to leave on the basis of opportunity. Okay, Rewalt's playing for another year, but you've got an opportunity to learn from one of the champions of the game in that key position role. The opportunity is going to come. I don't think he should be impatient. And, you know, Richmond's a great footy club, so the chances of you fulfilling your potential will be higher than, say, if you sell out and take a big contract at a club without the sort of recruitment and developing history. Kane Corns reckons Richmond should talk Rewalt into retiring to keep Coleman Jones. I'm not sure I would go that far. That's a pretty big call. But I'm going to guess that Coleman Jones stays at Richmond and backs himself to take over from Jack Rewalt in a couple of years. Next one we'll talk about is Collingwood's Braden Maynard. And this one surprised me. This one broke a couple of days ago. I think Brad Hardy came out and said categorically that Maynard will be a Melbourne demon in 2022. So on that basis, we can assume it's not true. 
for me, it is strange when people come out and make categorical statements that things are going to happen. Now, of course, you, you listen to it, but it doesn't really add up for me. Maynard's contracted next year, and Melbourne's back line is pretty elite. I'd be surprised if they're really investing heaps into another halfback flanker, even though Maynard is a very, very good player. Only way I see this happening is if Collingwood still have some residual contract and salary cap issues, which I believe could be the case. I don't think it's as simple as them clearing heaps of space, and now they're all good. Having said that, though, I am going to say there's probably not much to see here. Maynard's likely to be a pie next year. The next player we'll mention is Jack Billings, a restricted free agent from the St. Kilda Footy Club and one that's sort of been talked about for, I feel like, a few trade periods in a row. With St. Kilda looking the way they are at the moment, there may be a little less confidence in a club like St. Kilda having some success over the next few years and maybe Jack Billings is looking sideways and thinking, can I do better at another club? He's a former early pick. He might not feel like he's reached his potential and I think that would be a, a fair assertion to make. He's in pretty good form this year, 21 disposals and a goal a game, but I don't know if the offer he would get as a free agent, similar to Matt Crouch, would warrant a first round draft pick, and that may mean St. Kilda try and hang on to him. That being said, he can easily just request a trade, and there's a few suitors, I think, anyone who needs a half-decent forward midfielder in that sort of 25 to 26 range. I'm thinking Essendon, even North Melbourne, or a Carlton could be interested in a Jack Billings. I've been conservative with my predictions so far in this video. I'm going to say I'm going to guess that Jack Billings ends up at a different club this year. Next up, we've got a very interesting player in Jordan Clark from the Geelong Footy Club. He was a first-round draft pick a couple of years ago. One of the most talked-about young talents from that draft class has a very high ceiling and potentially a very good footy player, but isn't getting the opportunity that perhaps he deserves at Geelong. Apparently, he briefly considered a move away last year for more opportunity, but the Cats talked him into staying. He's still contracted until the end of next year, so they would have to talk Geelong into making a deal happen, but he's kind of been a victim of their selection policy. Obviously, they love their older players, and there's been a degree of success with that, but it may come at a cost if Jordan Clark suddenly doesn't feel like he's been valued the way he should. Only played seven games this year. I would totally understand if he's looking sideways, but what works in Geelong's favor is that he's still contracted for another year. So what I think will probably happen is no trade gets done this year and Geelong will back him into talking him into staying next year and give him plenty of opportunity. If a deal does happen this year, it's more likely to be Fremantle because as I said, West Coast don't really have the bargaining chips this year to make a deal happen. So my prediction is Jordan Clark stays at Geelong for another year, but beyond that, anything can happen. Next, we'll talk about a player who has been mentioned quite a lot over the last few years as a potential move, and that's Josh Kelly from the GWS Giants. There was talk of him moving to North Melbourne on big money a couple of years ago, but obviously he signed with the Giants for an extra two years to sort of buy himself time to make it decision. My understanding and what's been reported is that there's sort of a trigger on it that he can nominate, which basically can extend his contract to $8 million over eight years. So it's hard to imagine any other club coming in and offering him more money. One club that could is potentially North Melbourne, who've shown they don't mind opening the checkbook to get players, although they've never really been successful. He's returned to his best football just about this year with the Giants. I think the only real motivator for him would be chasing success or to go home. Honestly, I can see him weighing up success between GWS and North Melbourne and him deciding that GWS probably has a more exciting future. And I think that's a reasonable call to make. I think he will trigger his contract clause and stay with the Giants. Next, we'll talk about a North Melbourne player, Trent Dumont, who is a free agent at the end of this year. And I believe he looked around at the end of last year, but didn't quite find a new home. But I can imagine he's reassessing where North are at the moment. And for a player in his prime, it would make sense for him to maybe move to a club that's sort of more in contention. While his motivation may be success, he might not have a suitor that is willing to offer it to him. He's not a bad player by any stretch, but he's also probably just a, a solid B grader. So he's going to be looking for a club that's on the brink of success, but also rates him enough to give him a decent contract. Being South Australian, he may be a good fit for the Crows who want to add experience to a rebuilding list. At the end of the day, he's only 26. The Gold Coast Suns could be an option as well if, if they're still applying their strategy of adding some more experienced midfielders to the list. I think he could be a good get and maybe they can offer him a decent contract too. Being a free agent, you might even see Hawthorne add some experienced outside run to their list with Dumont or even a Fremantle who added Aish and had some success with him, but I don't know if they feel like they haven't properly replaced Langdon yet, they're an outside chance to be interested. My guess is he will probably be at a different club next year. It just remains to be seen where. Next, we'll talk about Melbourne Sam Wiedemann, who was out of contract at the end of this year. And he's a pretty talented key forward. And I think with Harry Mackay being signed up, him and Coleman Jones are two of the probably the most sought after key forward talents on the move this year. He's had a bit of injury bad luck this year. He's only played five games and now he's been squeezed out in favor of Ben Brown in that Melbourne team. He's a pretty talented player. I wouldn't be surprised if he backs himself to 
come back into the side. There's a consideration for him where now if he's going to be signing a new deal, probably doesn't make sense to do it anytime soon when he's just been dropped and hasn't really put his best foot forward this year. On the other hand, a lot could depend on the success of Ben Brown, who's still got a few years left at Melbourne. And they're obviously right in the thick of contention. If he absolutely kills it, then that might influence Wiedemann's decision. My personal opinion is it would be crazy for Wiedemann to leave the club. I think he should get his head down, work hard, get back into that team because Melbourne is a great place to be right now. I'd imagine he'll sign on a little bit later in the year to try and maximize his value. But one thing that could be a bit of a spanner in the works is if someone comes along and offers him a disproportionately high contract. Nonetheless, I don't think it'll happen. I think Wiedemann stays in Melbourne. One last player I'll talk about is Will Brody from the Gold Coast Suns, who's out of contract. And for me, he's always been an interesting player. He was a top 10 pick a number of years ago, but he hasn't really ever got his career started at the Gold Coast Suns managing just 23 games. From my understanding, he's always been sort of dominating the reserves, the NEFL and the VFL as well, putting his best foot forward as a big body midfielder. But obviously you look at the talent at the Gold Coast Suns and you think maybe we'll favor a Matty Rao, we'll favor a Noah Anderson and all these young mid inside mids at that club. For me, I think he presents value at a young rebuilding Victorian club who want to add talent quickly. You're looking at probably most notably North Melbourne. Essendon could be one that wants to add to their inside midfield stocks. Again, that kind of depends on how they go with the other targets. And I guess there's an outside chance Adelaide could be interested in picking him up. They had some success with Ben Keyes, who was dumped by Brisbane a few years ago. And obviously, they're still adding young talent to that list. And he probably adds a bit of a point of difference for them. To be honest, though, I will say that there is a good chance that he actually gets delisted and doesn't get picked up at all. Personally, though, I hope he does get traded to one of those rebuilding clubs and comes good. Well, that's it, guys. That is some of the players that are being talked about on the move this year. I did leave out a couple of players that I probably didn't think were worth mentioning, namely your Paddy Cripps. I don't think he's going to be leaving Carlton. I think that's just about signed up. You've got uh, Sean Darcy, I believe, is just about to sign with Fremantle. Tom Liberatore as well, I think, is on the brink of a two-year deal. And I think they've even said Josh Dunkley has pretty much made up his mind he's not leaving the Bulldogs. Another unrestricted free agent at the moment is Cam Guthrie. He's playing great footy for Geelong Cats. Just don't even think it's realistic enough to talk about it. I think he will certainly be a cat for life. That's it, guys. That's my thoughts on the potential trade period moves at the end of this year. Obviously, a lot of stuff to happen in between now and then. So only take my predictions with a grain of salt. But I always find trade rumors interesting. I hope you do too. Let us know in the comments if there's something I've missed or you know your own thoughts on the potential trades at the end of the year i'd appreciate if you liked the video if you enjoyed it and subscribe if you're new and we'll see you in the next video thanks guys